Um, now I want to pass over to uh, my colleague Amory Gray, who is going to lead the rest of the seminar and will introduce the other speakers as well. Thank you. Thanks. So it's really nice to see everybody, as Paula said, uh, at a face-to-face -face event today. And we're really pleased as a team to have the opportunity to present, I think, what have now even more so become really important findings and, and very timely findings. When we started working on the design of these questions for the Life and Time survey, which is something that we'd been wanting to do actually for, for a number of years, um, we knew that there was a concerning picture with regard to uh, increasing pressures in some households in Northern Ireland. And uh, of course, we knew that that was also going to be reflected in terms of the impact of the pandemic. Of course, we didn't anticipate just the really severe challenges that are, are currently facing households. So I think, as Paula said, this is really important baseline data for Northern Ireland. The British Social Attitude Survey has been asking questions along these lines for some time, but this is the first time that the Life and Time Survey has asked a set of questions like this. So today what we're going to do is that we'll provide you really with a snapshot, just a, a bit of an insight into some of the survey findings. As Paula said, the data is available on the website from today, um, but we will be doing further analysis and we will be publishing uh, further research updates and feature pieces in the coming weeks and we'll, uh, we'll be advertising those. So um, I'm just going to start the seminar proper now by handing over to my colleagues. I'll actually just introduce them as a team. So, uh, you know, as Paula said, I'm Anne-Marie Gray, co-director of ARC and social policy at Ulster. Uh, the next speaker is going to be uh, Sabrina Bunyan, who is in our economics department at Ulster. Um, Mark Simpson, who is in our law department, and Goretti Horgan, who's my colleague in the uh, social policy department. So um, without any further ado, uh, I'll pass over to Sabrina now. Okay, hello everyone. So just to um, follow on from um, Paula and Anne-Marie, the fieldwork for this survey was done in the final quarter of 2021. So it was at a time when just before the Omicron wave of COVID-19 um, um, infections started to increase. And it was also at a time when household finances were beginning to um, experience the shock of soaring energy, fuel and food prices. So there's, there was a numerous number of questions um, asked in this survey about um, household income and if respondents experienced financial hardship before and after COVID. And there was also questions asked if they did experience financial hardship, how did they actually cope with it? What type of things did they do um, to, to help their situation? So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to um, give um, a snapshot of some of the questions that were asked in relation <coughs> to um, financial hardship. And the first question that was asked was, since the coronavirus COVID-19 lockdown in March 2020, has your household income changed? Now, the figure here um, shows that although the majority of um, household income um, remains the same, stayed the same, there is over a quarter of households whose income had declined, okay? So that proportion, um, did experience um, a fall in their income. And what there is going to be a further analysis done here where there's going to be um, a numerous amount of variables being controlled for, and we'll be able to identify the characteristics of those who actually um, said that their um, income had declined. And the different types of characteristics that we'll be looking at will be age, gender, um, education level, working status, so a whole numerous bunch of variables like that, and it will be controlled for. So then we'll be able to just get um, an idea, the people that said that, who actually are there, who are there, and then that will hopefully um, help policymakers um, be able to, um, you know, identify some policies that will um, help improve um, the situation for those people. Then another question that was asked is, have you experienced <coughs> any financial um, hardship during the two years before COVID and since the lockdown in March 2020? So the figure here is showing basically an overall increase in financial hardship. 
because people were given a few options to choose from. They were asked, okay, did you experience financial hardship? And they can choose yes a lot, yes a little, or no, they didn't experience any financial hardship. It can be clear and clear and seen quite clearly that during the two years before COVID, 7% of respondents reported um, um, financial hardship, but since the first COVID um, lockdown, that had increased to 10%. Those who reported no financial hardship in the two years before COVID was 67%, but this had um, declined to 63% in, since the first lockdown. So again, as I said, this is just showing that financial hardship had increased, but like the previous slide, again, there's going to be another, a further analysis done here to actually um, identify those who um, experience financial hardship, again, controlling for um, a numerous um, amount of variables. There has been um, some analysis done on this, on the gender differences between those who experienced um, financial hardship. And the results that show the raw data that females did experience um, more financial hardship before COVID and after COVID. So then following from this, um, respondents were asked if they experienced financial hardship since the first lockdown, how did they cope with it? So there was 501 respondents who said they had um, experienced financial hardship. And then they were asked, as I said, how did they cope? So for the majority, um, they borrowed from friends or family. Here they were using the more mainstream um, lending services, the traditional banks. We do have a proportion of people that were using food bank, but of course less were using the non-traditional means, using payday lenders and doorstep lenders. So there is a vast amount of data um, from the survey with, as I said, more research that can be done, as I said, to analyze and to actually clearly identify those who are struggling in society. And so we, we will be working on this over the next while. And hopefully then when these analyses <coughs> are done, it is going to be of benefit um, to policymakers. OK, so that's just providing you a snapshot of financial hardship and how people um, dealt with it. Now I'm going to pass you over to Greshi, who's going to talk to us about the cost of living. Um, thanks, Sabrina. So um, we asked two questions uh, that were aimed at um, understanding just how much uh, families were struggling. Um, and I have to say that when we chose these questions, we didn't know how bad things were going to be. So this would have been uh, this this time of year, last year. So we didn't actually realise um, how bad things were going to get. Um, but the two questions that we, sh we decided to ask were questions that are um, that have been asked um, in other surveys, like the Poverty and Social Exclusion Survey um, and uh, the Family Resources Survey. So the question on whether your family could afford to, or your household could afford a, a, an unexpected but necessary expense. So we're thinking about things like cookers breaking down, like your hot water boiler breaking down, those kind of things that are absolutely necessary. And we found that a quarter of the, a quarter of respondents said that they were unable to pay um, such a, an expense. Uh, more worryingly, um, they if you look at the age group here of the um, the differences in the age groups, you'll see that while older people were generally speaking um, uh, well able uh, to, to meet that expense, um, in the younger age groups, um, it really rose the number of people who were unable to um, uh, meet that £500 expense. Now, why are we worried about that particular age group? Because they're the group who are most likely to have children in their households. Um, and therefore, they're the, mo the group that are most likely uh, to actually need to have hot water, need to have uh, all of the kind of white goods um, that are usually um, a... a that are the things that, that break down. Even more worryingly, two thirds of those uh, households that say that they um, are, have lower, are, are lower income uh, said that they would be unable to meet um, that, uh, in, that uh, uh, unnecessary expense. Um, of course, £500 is an awful lot less than what everybody's uh, fuel bills are going to be increased, increasing by. So the fact that that many households were unable to meet the £500 additional expense 
in, in, in this time last year um, is actually very worrying in terms of how they're going to meet um, the additional costs um, of fuel. Um, and it's worth just pointing out that there was very little difference between those who are in paid employment and those who are not in paid employment in terms of meeting that additional expense. And also actually in relation to the second question we asked, which was about turning down or turning off heat, even though your house is cold, uh, because you couldn't meet the um, additional, um, uh, because, you, because you couldn't meet the costs. Um, so a quarter of people said, a quarter of respondents said that they had to turn the house, uh, the heating down or off. Now remember, we were asking them about the previous winter. So we were asking them about the winter 2020. So before uh, fuel price, uh, price rises um, really started to um, uh, increase. Um, and again, there's an age group difference. Um, insofar as um, we found that uh, people in the younger age groups were more likely to be saying that they'd be having to turn the heating down or off. And this really goes back again to the question of children in the household, uh, which is why we worry about um, younger, younger age groups um, being more likely to say that they'd have to turn the heat, they'd had to turn the heating down or off. Because actually there's a lot of evidence that a children's mental health and especially teenagers' mental health is very badly impacted by living in a cold house. Um, and so therefore, you know, when you look at the the mental health issues in um, households that are struggling in this way. So you have maternal mental health being very badly impacted by the stress of you know, how, how, how to make ends meet. And then on top mm -hmm. of that, you have the children and young people's mental health um, being, uh, being, being impacted as well. Um, and uh, I would also just like to sort of mention that, of course, a lot of families who have um, a person with a disability um, living in the home are going to be, um, they, they'll have higher uh, fuel bills because you know, if you're sedentary, clearly you need you need the heating on more, um, and there's um, we we don't ask about a disability, um, but it is something that we really need need to take into account. And one hopes that when the government um, is making whatever um, announcement it's making today um, about the cost of living crisis, that there will be some extra money there uh, for people uh, our families who um, um, who are dealing with disability. Um, the um, uh, in terms of uh, what. So you know some of the some of the issues that um, came up, uh, we were not at all surprised um, by how many people said that they wouldn't be able to meet the five hundred pound expense. We know from the family resources survey that thirty six percent of people here in Northern Ireland have no of households rather have no savings. Um, and again, that was 19, 2019 20 So you know two or three years on, and um, it's likely to be even less again. Um, the National uh, National Institute of Economic and Social Research um, has done some modeling about what the impacts um, of the uh, uh, the cost of the the, co the cost of living uh, increase I was going to say but it's really it's more than an increase isn't it? it's gone right it's, it's gone up so much um, and they've uh, estimated that um, here in Northern Ireland about over 90,000 people already face food and energy bills that are greater than their disposable income so in other words it's already the case and that there's a very large section of our population um, that are unable to um, meet just the, I mean, when people talk about heating or eating, that there'll be, uh, but actually increasingly families are finding it difficult to do either. Um, so uh, those are all really quite um, depressing uh, um, uh, findings. Um, and uh, it's just worth making the point that um, we're not really surprised um, at the differences between those in work and not in work and um, because we know that actually when it comes to for example children living in poverty that the majority of children who are living in poverty are living in households where there is at least one adult in work so really this isn't it's not just a crisis for people who are living on benefits the cost of living crisis is also very much um, a crisis for people uh, who are in employment so i'm going to leave it there and turn over to mark simpson who has some i think some more cheery uh, things to talk about. Not often I get it reduced in those terms. Um, so in common with some of the other things we've been talking about this morning, um, the Life and Time survey last really looked at uh, Social Security back in 2000 when it had a, a set of questions on, uh, on welfare reform. Uh, not much since, although there are some indications in the uh, Department for Communities Omnibus survey of, of what people think about, about certain aspects of the, of the system. 
Um, questions we asked in this part of the survey broke down into two broad categories. So first of all, we had um, some who looked at the question of adequacy, what level of income and what standard of living benefits should actually uh, guarantee. Uh, and the other set, which is you know not unrelated to the question of what the appropriate level should be, um, looked at questions about fairness and reciprocity in the, in the system and also the, the, the deservingness of, of social security claimants. I'm uh, not going to be able to cover all of those uh, right now, but um, we'll look at, uh, at, at some of the headlines. So the thing that really jumps out uh, from the uh, survey responses, which is where uh, Goretti's point about, about having a more cheerful message comes in, is that um, there's a really clear message that people in Northern Ireland value um, a, a social safety net that ensures people have a, an, an acceptable standard of living. We'll, we'll look at some of the numbers on that in, a, in more detail in, in a moment. There is something of a paradox in there though, because at the same time, we've quite a significant minority, um, just over 37%, who agreed with the proposition that benefit income should be capped, uh -huh. um, regardless of factors like uh, like family size or, or housing costs. Um, the reason I say it's a paradox is that um, it's, you know, it's quite difficult to reconcile the concept of a cap on benefit incomes that you know, that actually makes any meaningful contribution to, to controlling social security spending um, with the idea that, you know, even larger families or people in areas with higher housing costs um, should, um, should be able to have a, a, a normal or even, or even basic standard of living. Um, a couple of other findings that are, you know, things that I guess social security has a, has a role in, in potentially addressing, but are also relevant to some of the points that uh, Lam Marie will, will come back on in a minute. Um, over 50% of respondents thought that the income distribution in Northern Ireland was unfair. Um, close to half agreed that it was the responsibility of government to reduce differences in income between people with high and low incomes. And also um, a fairly strong indication that people agree that for that to happen, it's right that people with uh, with um, higher incomes should pay um, a higher proportion in, in taxes compared to those in, uh, in, in lower incomes. <coughs> Maybe we'll look at some of the uh, response rates on, um, on the social security questions. So the most, um, maybe the most striking one in terms of the, the level of consensus is that 90% of respondents agreed or strongly disagreed that social security should enable an individual or family to meet their, their basic living needs. Now, that's a relatively modest aspiration for, the, uh, for um, any social protection system, but the findings that uh, Sabrina and Goretti have been highlighting um, do show that this is far from guaranteed at, at the minute. So even if it's a modest ambition, it still shows, um, I, I think, a, a level of ambition. Um, even when we look at the, um, I suppose, the, the higher aspiration for um, an individual or family to the normal standard of living, still a fairly healthy majority in, in support of, um, of, of that idea, more than, uh, more than 60%. Um, the question of, uh, of, a, of whether benefits should allow an individual or family to live a life in dignity. It's maybe a little bit more ambiguous in terms of what level of income that refers to, whether it is to do with income or whether it's to do with how people in interact with the system. But again, really strong support for that, that, uh, for that, uh, for that statement, over 80%. Um, all this is, uh, is really interesting given how you know, widely it's been remarked about um, the kind of the message that there's been from large sections of the, the media and also large sections of the uh, you know the UK political class over the over the last decade, this kind of anti social security, anti welfare and you know, in some cases overtly anti people on benefits statements that um, that that we'll all be uh, that, that we'll all be familiar with. <laughs> it's also um, striking when you compare it with the British Social Attitudes Survey findings, and that show pretty limited support for social security spending, especially on the on the unemployed. Um, so there is cause for, um, for for optimism in there. Um, one thing that's a little bit less clear about how this fits with the bigger picture is that recent research in Great Britain suggests that some of those attitudes are starting to shift in the last couple of years. Um, 
partly a pandemic effect, but um, actually seems to to predate the um, the, the the arrival of um, of the pandemic. The fact that we've got limited information from the past and what people in Northern Ireland think about these things means that it's hard to say for sure if that's happening here, but. Um, from this survey, we do see that around 20% of respondents say that uh, they now have a more favourable view of social security spending and of social security claimants than what they than what they did before the pandemic. So, with potentially that's a fair chunk of people who are uh, who are um, who are changing their whose attitudes are, are shifting to, to some extent. Um, that sort of slightly contradictory finding is on the on the, the notion of a benefit cap is, is highlighted at the bottom. Should probably it's probably worth stressing that almost as many people disagreed with it as, as agreed. So it's you know it's not a sort of open and open and shut case. I think it's also no coincidence that 37% of respondents also felt that benefits should be set at a level that forces people to uh, to work. Um, but even uh, um, even there, um, if we look back to the 2017 Omnibus survey from, from the Department for Communities, there's potentially a, a, a slight drop in the, in, the, in the number of people who, who, are, who are kind of um, looking at that social security as, as a deterrent to, to paid work. Not comparing like with like, but, but I think there's a, there, there's a hint of that. Um, when we break this down a little bit into um, uh, into, um, into different groups of um, of respondents, no matter what way you do it, there's an extremely high level of consensus that um, that a basic standard of living should be uh, should be guaranteed to to everyone, no matter what your income is, no matter what your gender is, wherever you sit on the political spectrum, you know. Almost 90% of DUP and Sinn Féin supporters agreed with that statement. Over 90% of supporters of the other three main of each of the other three main parties agreed with it. So um, it's, um, it, it's it's pretty overwhelming, no matter how you look at it. Um, a little bit more variance in the and you know that more ambitious statement that social security should enable a, a normal standard of living. Uh, more support from that for the uh, for the low income group compared to the. Uh, Compared to the higher income group, um, also somewhat more support from um, from uh, supporters of nationalist parties compared to um, compared to supporters of um, unionist or parties or, or alliance. Um, but um, you know, just uh, <laughs> even at that, you know, just about a majority of um, of of, um, of people agreed, to, uh, regardless of um, of, um, of political allegiance. And again, strong support across the different groups for the, the notion that benefits should um, support a life in dignity. You know, so in most of these cases, there's sort of there's differences of, of degree in terms of how um, of how strongly particular groups support the uh, agree with the principles, um, but usually not any difference in the uh, in the majority perspective, no matter um, uh, no matter how you break it down. Um, Hand over to Anne Marie to wrap things up. Thank you, Mark. So, um, you know, I think it's important to say that in the Northern Ireland Life and Times survey, we report findings, we don't shape them. So, we're reporting what the public think. Now, of course, the survey was conducted. Um, in the autumn, early winter of last year, whenever the executive was functioning. So it's not reflecting, you know, the, the, the current lack of an, an executive. So um, very few people thought that the executive was doing all it could to reduce poverty. Um, but the almost um, half, 49.3% of respondents agreed that it was the responsibility of the government to reduce differences in income between people with high and low incomes. So people see a role for government in addressing that inequality, but they certainly don't think that they're doing enough. Now, um, if you look at the slide, you, you can see for, for, for yourselves there um, that um, the number of people who feel that the executive is doing all it can is really very, very small. Uh, the majority of people feel that it, that it isn't. There are some nuances. Um, 
people, respondents who are Sinn Féin supporters were more likely than those of the other main political parties um, to uh, agree, followed by SDLP supporters and so on. And it's only among the Ulster Unionist Party supporters that people uh, that more people disagree than agree. So um, I think that gives us, gives the executive rather, a lot of food for thought in terms of political implications of this. I know in years past in the survey, we haven't asked these questions, but we have asked questions about trust in government. We've asked question, people what they think about devolution and so on. So some of those political attitude questions are interesting. Um, what do we know about what government has been doing to address poverty b before the collapse? Well, we do know that in the last assembly mandate that a number of strategies uh, got underway. Well, not well. The design of a number of strategies got underway. So, expert working groups completed work on anti-poverty strategies, on disability strategy, and on a gender equality strategy. And then the department, the minister for the Department for Communities, had also uh, commissioned other reviews of uh, welfare mitigations and so on, um, and discretionary support scheme. Now the. Um, the expert reports were published, co-design groups were set up. The intention was that those uh, strategies would, would be published before, um, you know, certainly before the, uh, the, the end of the, the mandate, and that didn't happen. But of course, you know, in the interim, the need for these strategies has significantly increased. Um, the current fuel poverty strategy dates back to 2011. And I heard Pat Austin comment in, on, on the media last week that that was also something which um, was supposed to have been reviewed and updated in, in the last mandate. Oh, there. So um, the other thing that you know I really wanted to say about this is that Mark has talked about Social Security and the public, I suppose, vision or, or attitudes around Social Security. And that is one thing. But we also know from you know other research about the things that contribute to poverty, the things that contribute to unemployment and so on. And we know that none of these things can be addressed in isolation. So there's a task for government to do in terms of social security and certainly in terms of an, an immediate response to some of these issues. But we, you know, we also know that the reason why we needed a disability strategy, a gender strategy and so on is because of the intersectionality of all of those issues. Um, and of course, with the worsening um, cost of living crisis, with increasing rates of poverty, we are going to see that reflected in health inequalities. We're going to see it reflected in both physical and mental ill health. And you know, much of the discussion that's taken place about health services is about how we reorganize, how we plan, how we increase access. Those aren't the things fundamentally that are going to make a difference to people's health. It's the kinds of things we've been talking about today, you know, the levels of income, the levels of inequality. It's addressing those things that are going to make a difference to people's health. Um, alongside the income that people get, we saw from research that we published just in the, in the last quarter of last year, um, an increase in homelessness, but particularly an increase in what we called hidden homelessness. And a lot of that was driven by the housing market, the increasing cost of private rented sector, and that um, that increasing cost not being met by levels of social security. So people being pushed uh, into overcrowded situations or being uh, or, or into hostels and so on. So there is no doubting that there is uh, much for government to do. Um, the, today, you know, as Gretty said, the treasury will be announcing. Um, it is said, uh, mitigations around cost of living, uh, depending on what those look like, um, but it almost certainly won't be in addition to social security benefits, we will require an executive to make a decision about how that money is spent and how that money is allocated. So we are um, certainly in a little bit of a, a crisis. Um, I also wanted to um, say something about what's in the survey and what we haven't talked about today uh, and what, what you can um, anticipate in the future. Um, we did look at, we asked questions about whether the public thought that people should be forced into uh, paid work or not. Um, we asked about whether social security should be available only for a fixed period. Um, we asked about um, 
parity. So whether benefits across the United Kingdom should be the same or whether benefits should uh, reflect the cost of living and so on. Uh, and we asked, uh, as uh, Sabrina had said, uh, more questions about COVID and work uh, and those attitudes that we can link then to, you know, to, to the other data as well. Um, and the other thing that we'll be doing is some qualitative research, including with people who responded to this survey. So we asked people to indicate if they would be prepared to take part in um, some interviews um, about just looking a little bit more detail about why they thought certain things. So the, the, the survey tells us what they thought, but not necessarily why they think that way. So we think that would be really interesting to, to follow through on that. So um, time now for questions. So I will share the questions. Mike